Well, here we are again, folks. This is Brother Peter with Tidbits from the Word. <clears throat> One of the reasons I'm in this setting right here today for a few minutes is I wanted you to see the birds coming and eating off my bird feeder outside. I want you to know that every last one of those birds belongs to God. I want you to know that God said in the Bible, He knows every last one of those birds. He said, I'm not five sparrows sold for a farthing, and I know every one of them that falls to the ground. How much more do I know you? How much more do I love you? Now we're in the book of Revelation, chapter 2. And I would ask this question this morning, does God know you? That would be the question I would ask in Revelation chapter 2 to you. And uh, we're going to read just from 8 to 11 verse today, right here. And this from 8 to 11 verses, ask some questions. And this was written to the epistle of Smyrna, the church at Samaria. There was a place called Samaria, and the church was called Smyrna. And it was in Samaria. Well, Samaria was a place where the people were not Jews. Do you remember when Jesus told the disciples, I must go through Samaria, I need to? Because God, he didn't say this now about the woman at the well, but she was going to be there and he knew it. So he said, I got to go meet a woman at the well. He didn't say that either, but he knew it. That's where he was going. He knew before he went where he's going because he sees everything, just like he sees those birds right there. You say, Brother Peter, do you need to feed those birds? No, I don't need to feed those birds. God will take care of those birds. I read a statistic one time that said if you took 100, 100 train car loads of bird seed and took it out, it would not feed the, the uh, birds for one day. 100 car loads of bird seed would not feed the birds for one day. And God feeds every bird on the earth every day. Now, listen, God is God and he's all nothing. Is there anything too big for God? Is there anything impossible for God? No. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you what we're looking at. In the book of Revelation, this is what we're looking at. We're looking at a God that has been in amongst the seven churches ever since they started. He's walked around in amongst them. He's took his hand and he's changed angels for those churches through periods of time. That's the uh, leader. The angel is the one that carries the word. He's changed some angels through the churches over the years. But one thing that has never changed in these churches is some of the things that the churches have a habit of passing on. We have become people of habit and people that have set things up and made a habit in them. And we think that's the way it's got to be in order to be church. Now here he is, he's writing to this, uh, by the way, he calls it an epistle in Samaria. That means that there were some writings written directly to that church of Samaria. And he writes unto them, unto angel, write these things. He's telling John, saith first, and the last, which was dead, and now is alive. Now Jesus is going to keep saying this, Seven, eight, this is about the eighth time we've heard him say it. Now, you know what? He's going to say it all the way through. You know why? He wants us to hear that he died. That's the death, and that he rose again from the burial, and that's the resurrection. He was buried, he died and was buried, he rose again, and that's the resurrection, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Well, Brother Peter, what is the gospel? The gospel is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. The whole gospel in a nutshell. The death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you believe that, then you can believe he sent the Holy Spirit. And if you can believe that, you can say, Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin." Come in my heart and save my soul and give me that Holy Spirit and he'll do that. And then he'll show you when you get in the Bible or under a good believing church and you're in the synagogue or the church the first day of the week. You come on in there and somebody's going to tell you about, you know, after you're saved, you need to be baptized. What is baptism? 
that show in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then there's another thing after that. It comes immediately after that. And that is the thing called tithing. 10%. Oh my goodness, I just said that and there's going to be so many people call or write or say, hey, that's in the Old Testament. No, it's in the New Testament too. 10% of everything you make, come bring it to the storehouse that there be no gatherings when I come in the book of Revelations. When I come just before the great seven years of tribulation and I come back on the earth, I don't want to see any gatherings there or a bunch of money to go to the devil or go to waste. So spend it now on getting other people saved. Are you spending any of your money getting other people saved besides the 10% you put in church? Ask yourself these questions. Who am I? Am I a Christian? Am I a Christ-like person? Am I devoting everything I have to God? You know what Jesus said? He said, I don't have any place to lay my head. He didn't even have a pillow. He didn't spend a dollar on the world stuff. He walked three years through this world not spending any money on the world, but only on, on, on other people. He spent his time and everything on other people. All right, now let's put it there. He walked in the midst of the churches and in the midst of Samaria here. He said, I know thy works, and I know thy tribulation, and thy poverty, but them that are rich, and I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but I know the synagogue of Satan. They're of the synagogue of Satan. There are people in the church that are of the synagogue of Satan. They're not of God. In verse 10, he said, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Uh, be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. If you die for the word of God, you're going to get that crown of life. And listen, dying to the flesh is a death too. You might not be cast into the prison house down here with the bars on it, but you're going to be cast into prison. A lot of people aren't going to like you. I meet a lot of people who don't like me. I meet a lot of people think that I've rushed at them with the gospel or I've come too fast, too hard upon them. Well, sometimes I do let my zeal overrun me. If you should happen to be watching this excerpt right here and I in any way have come and offended you with my zeal, forgive me, but I do have a zeal sometimes that I push a little too hard a, a real good friend of mine, uh, Brother uh, Brad Thompson, told me uh, not too long ago, Brother Peter, the Holy Spirit doesn't push. The Holy Spirit leads. Be careful. And I need to be careful not to be a pusher, but to be a leader. Listen to this last verse that we're going to read in this one today. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall be hurt of, not hurt of the second death. He that overcometh shall not be hurt by the second death. You say, Brother Peter, are you an overcomer? Yes, I am. When did you become an overcomer? On November 5th, 1972, 3 o'clock in the morning, the Lord knocked on my heart. I was drunk out there, wrecked my car. The Lord knocked on my heart and said, it's time for you to get right or you'll never get right again. Have a chance. I said, God, I looked up to heaven. I'm a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Come in my heart and save my soul. At that very moment, I overcame the devil. And I've been an overcomer ever since. And I will die an overcomer. You say, Brother Peter, you don't think you'll sin between now and now? Yes, I think I'll sin many times. But when I do, it's not my desire to sin, but when I do, I have 1 John 5 to fall on, where it says that God is faithful and just. If we sin and we ask him to forgive us of that sin, he will cleanse us from that sin and from all unrighteousness, and he will not hold that against us. What a beautiful